Since being spun off from National Data Corporation in 2001, Global Payments has put together an incredible string of earnings growth as an independent company averaging over 17.85%. Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, aka Mr. Valuation. And today I'm going to present another Analyze Out Loud video on the stock that I'm going to classify as a growth stock, even though it does pay a modest dividend. It doesn't have a great dividend record, but it really does have a great growth record. But it's also done this through acquisitions, and that's something that you know the company is going to be continue to, to do. But they're also doing strategic cooperations with companies like Alphabet, Google, and so on. And it's a payment processing company. And so we're going to take a look at it through the fat lens of the fast graphs, and, and I'm going to analyze the video out loud with you and, and look at it by the numbers. There is some good and there is some bad about this company. And then we're going to talk a little about valuation and the importance of valuation and how it works with growth stocks. So let's go ahead and get into the company here. As you can see, the earnings record of this company since it went public has been very, very consistent on an operating basis. These are adjusted operating earnings. Now, the company has made numerous acquisitions. It acquired United Card Service, Russia's leading credit card processing company in 2009. It made acquisitions in 2012, 2014, 2015, 2016. And they just recently made a big acquisition with a company called Evo. So, you know, the company is a serial acquirer. Now, the reason I mention that is because I want you to notice that if you're looking at diluted earnings, which FastGraphs lets you do, the company's diluting earnings record is quite different than its operating record because of accounting convention. You know, non-cash charges, write-offs, acquisition expenses, and so on. Okay, so, you know, the focus from a valuation point of view is on the operating earnings. And then we'll look at cash flows and look at sales a little bit later. Now, when I put the price and correlate the weekly closing stock prices to this graph spanning more than 20 years, you see just how consistently the company's price has tracked its earnings. And you see periods of time, as I always like to point out, where it gets undervalued below its earnings justified level, which is what the orange line in this graph is. And there are times when the market values a stock like this over its earnings justified level. And those are usually in good times. Like notice that we had earnings growth here of 32%, 26 and 29 significantly higher than the 17.8 average. So that partially justifies some of this overvaluation. But then, of course, you know, it went back to a 20% growth rate and a 3% growth rate, and that brought the company's stock price back into line. Now, historically, this is a high-quality company. It's triple B minus rated. And I think because of the consistent earnings growth, the market has had a penchant at times for putting a premium valuation of around 22 times earnings on the company. Now, the good news on that is currently you can buy the company at a blended P.E. of about 13.85 with an earnings yield of 7.22 percent, which I consider to be very attractive. Now, there's an investing principle here about valuation and what the importance of valuation is that I'd like to spend a little time talking about. Valuation is about prudence. It's about buying a stock or investing in a company where you are positioning yourselves to participate in the future growth of the company. Valuation all by itself does not ensure that you're going to make good rates of return. If you have a slow growth company, buying it at value simply means you're probably going to get a slow growth return on your capital over time. Now, typically, lower growth companies tend to pay a lot larger in dividends. So your reward is usually associated with getting income, like a utility stock are known to have higher yields. You know, certain REITs that grow at, you know, 5 or 6% have high yields. A lot of the MLPs that are in the oil and gas industry that are the transportation and storage companies generate high yields. So it's also important to recognize when you're investing what you're investing for. A company like Global Payments is all about investing for growth. And I define a growth stock as a stock that's capable of increasing earnings growth and cash flow growth at over 15% a year. And you can see global payments fully covers that. Now, the beauty of that is that valuation is prudent. That's the optimum price that you can pay where you're getting a good value for the stock. Obviously, it's even better to buy the stock when it's undervalued. 
But the key is your total return is going to be a function of dividends that they pay, if any, but it's really primarily going to be focused on how much growth there is. I covered that in my last video when I talked about the rule of 72 and how compounding is important. And by the way, I did have a comment there saying it was unfair to compare Alphabet, Google, which I did, to companies like Southern Company. Now, the, the point was missed, I think, by that particular comment was that valuation is a function of soundness and prudence, okay? The growth is going to come from how fast the investment that you're investing in is capable of growing. And that's what I think global payments is all about. I believe this is a total return opportunity or what they call GARP, growth at a reasonable price. Because obviously the company has fallen from being very highly valued in, you know, 2020, 2019 and so on. And now you can buy this at a discount to its fair value and at a significant discount to the PE or the multiple that the market has historically applied. So that gives you kind of a good case or a prudent case and then an aggressive case. Look at what this company can do, and I'll get more into that. But again, I want to point out, because it is such an, a, an acquirer, its diluted earnings growth is not going to look as attractive as its operating earnings growth, which is more functionally related to cash flows. Okay, because again, there's a lot of non-cash charges here, and a lot of websites only produce diluted earnings or gap earnings, as they're also referred to. And so you got to make sure you know what kind of earnings you're looking at. From a standpoint of operating cash flow, despite the fact that they've made a lot of acquisitions and spent a lot of money, you can see that they've really generated good operating cash flow growth, averaging about just under 14% a year. And more recently, in the last nine years or so, which I can do with, you know, fast graphs is, you know, including some estimate data here, by the way, you know, they, they've been averaging about 17% growth and the, the market's been giving it about a 20 multiple. These are facts that you need to understand and you need to, you know, look at over these different time frames because that's very important. But from a standpoint of operating cash flow, the company's generated good growth even though they've done it through acquisitions. And likewise, their free cash flow growth has averaged 14%, and it's actually been much more consistent, and the stock is trading in line with what I would call an attractive price-to-free cash flow level right now. That's another plus from looking at the company from a standpoint of, you know, is it an attractive investment here? EBITDA which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, is another way to look and view companies from a valuation point of view. And with EBITDA, we are only showing on the fast graphs the normal price to EBITDA or the market price to EBITDA. In other words, what price to EBITDA the market has generally applied. That's been about 11.85 times earnings. And you can buy the company now at a blended price to EBITDA of 9.18 or below the price to EBITDA. So it looks very attractively valued from that point of view. And then last but not least, I'm going to look at sales. Now, sales growth has been strong. It's averaged about 11% a year. But during the COVID years, there was some interruptions in their business model a little bit. So the company did suffer some slower growth, you know, for a couple of years during COVID, but it's back on track, you know, growing again expected to grow back at 10% going forward. So, you know, at a price to sales, it looks okay if you're looking at the normal price to sales for the last five or six years. Over a longer term, it doesn't look quite as good. Now, next, what I would like to do is go into forecasting, because although you can learn a great deal from the past, I think you can see by looking at this company, it's strung together a really consistent level of earnings growth at a very high rate relative to the average company over time. So what's the future look like? Now, looking at the future, the company is pretty well followed. There are 32 analysts, 27 analysts, and 28 analysts for the next couple of years, and their, their fiscal year ends in December, expecting some 15 to 16 percent growth 2022, followed by 16 percent growth in 2023. And we lose a few analysts here, but there are still a consensus of 12 analysts expecting 16 percent growth going forward. One thing I want to point out, when you're looking at one- and two-year forward forecasts, if you look at the company's analyst scorecard, it's been almost impeccable. The one-year forward forecast has been correct 92% of the time. They've only missed 8% of the time, and that was in 2020, you know, during the COVID year, which is somewhat understandable. 
going on a two-year forecast, the companies had almost a perfect record of meeting analyst estimates, and they just had a good earnings report recently. So this tells me that the analysts have a good handle on forecasting this company. It doesn't guarantee that the numbers are correct, but it does give you some idea that, you know, it's a company that guides analysts pretty well, and the analysts are able to get a pretty good handle in spite of the fact that they've made all these acquisitions. Now, one thing about analyst estimates, they have gone down a little bit in the last six months from $9.54 to $9.46. But the company did give some optimistic after their last earnings report guidance going forward. And likewise, estimates came down a little bit for 2023 and 2024, but they're pretty much holding up. So it looks like, you know, the analysts are expecting 16%. Now, if you use the P equals growth rate, pay ratio of one, you know, that Peter Lynch originally promoted, this would mean that you could have a potential to earn 24% from here out through 2024, assuming the company just trades at a 16 PE. That would be a very modest PE expansion of just 13.85%. If you look at forecasting from the standpoint of the normal market multiple, which has averaged close to 24 over the last five years, then the opportunity is a lot higher. So this is a much you know, more optimistic expectation, if you will, but it could generate just really 45, 50% annualized rates of return over the next couple of years based on the company's growth. Long-term growth expectations, according to the analysts reporting the facts, that are also at 18% which would give you a nice double-digit 20% plus annualized rate of return going forward. But again, this is a total return investment. It does pay a dividend, but it's not much of a dividend payer. Now, a couple other things I want to talk about here during this video is I want to look at historical performance. I want to reiterate the point I made. See, a growth stock like this, now it came out back in 2001 when it went you know, originally went public, it was trading at pretty high multiples, 28, you know, times earnings. But because the company has grown so fast, if you look at long-term performance during this time, the company has outperformed the market by almost a factor of two to one and produced almost as much, well, not quite, about two-thirds of the dividend income that the market did. But this company would attend 10000 into 191000 compared to 10000 into 34000 Remember the power of compounding that I talked about in my last video. Now, they did have a couple of dividend cuts in 2017 and 18, according to what I'm seeing. So, you know, the dividend record isn't great, as I mentioned. It's a little spotty. But I also want to point out that that might be misleading because the company changed its fiscal year notice from May in 2015 to a calendar fiscal year. So you see a little gap here where you see an 18-month period which I think partially explains why the dividend looks as shady as it did. But it, did, it was cut in 2017, in 2018. But I also want you to notice that their payout ratio has expanded quite a bit from a, a very, very low rate historically, only 2 or 3%. Again, this has been primarily a growth company. You know, their dividend payout ratio was extremely low here for years, single digit, you know, 5 2 3%. 1%, and now it's up to about 10 or 12%. So they are becoming a little more dividend-oriented as the company's growth goes. Now, a couple of negatives about the company, I think, is worth looking at. So let's go into the financials, and let's go ahead and go into the health check. And one thing I want to point out is return on equity. I want to look at return on equity. The company really has relatively low returns on equity, and that's a dig on the company, but it, it does do great volumes you know, it's a payment processor. And so it kind of makes it up on volume, if you will. That's why they've been able to generate, you know, the growth that they have. But, you know, their balance sheet is pretty strong. They have negotiated some financing here recently with Silverstream Partners. So, you know, all in all, I think this company looks very attractive here if you're a growth stock investor and, you know, you're looking to see the company grow. Now, you know, they've got several other acquisitions pending, one of the big acquisitions that they just recently made was they bought Evo Payments, and this is supposed to really expand their footprint dramatically. And then they're also, you know, they've been in negotiations with FIS to merge with them, which would be one of their largest ever. And that deal fell through a couple of years ago, It'd be about a $70 billion deal. So one of the aspects of the company's growth potential is that Morningstar gives it four stars. 
they give it a fair value of 186. And by the way, that fair value of 186 would be approximately somewhere around the normal PE or the market PE, you know, that we see, you know, for the company. So, you know, we're sort of in sync. Fastgraph sort of agrees with them. The company is an acquirer of other companies. And, you know, they did merge with Total Systems in 2019, as Morningstar said. And that was a, you know, a big deal for them. So I look for more of these mergers. You know, they just did the Evo payments. I look for more of these mergers in the future. I think this is a, a good growth story at a very reasonable price here. I've just beginning conducting my research on it. If I'm looking, you know, for the, those of my clients who are looking for total return, I think this one sort of fits the bill. It has a triple B minus credit rating. It only has just under 30% debt to capital. So they're financially strong. Their balance sheet, I think, is strong. Again, they generate good cash flows, as I pointed out before, and they generate, you know, pretty consistent and strong free cash flows. And they're growing those at a nice, attractive rate and expected to continue to grow them. So all in all, I think this would be something that's worthy of, you know, further consideration if you're a total return investor or a growth investor where you're looking to generate wealth and, you know, make a higher rate of return than the market. This company has outperformed the market dramatically over almost any time frame that you could measure. You know, it's had a significantly higher rate of return even during this period of time when the market has been so strong, you know, coming out of the Great Recession, so to speak. You know, this company has outperformed the market dramatically, and it's been a time when the market itself has performed very well. So if you're looking for above average rates of return, above market potential, you might want to take a closer look at Global Payments, Inc. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the fundamentals analyzer software tool, doing with doing an Analyze Out Loud video by the numbers on Global Payments, Inc. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give me a like, ring the bell. And guys, take a look at FastGraphs, unbelievable research tool that really allows you to take a company apart in so many different ways and gives you such a great perspective of the business behind the stock that you're looking at investing in. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival saying thanks for watching.